Well, I'm really glad to be back today. How many of you guys were in here yesterday? Yes, that's good. How many of you guys got to be here to hear me last year? Okay, so good. The front row people. This is, I do have fans. I like this. All right. Well, I'm going to give the same disclaimer that I gave yesterday, uh, that we're talking about archaeology again. Uh, this time we're talking about uh, the site of Telesophy or Gath, as we know it in the Bible. Uh, and we're talking about excavating the enemy. But the problem with doing archaeology is that we're constantly doing it, right? Um, the stuff we talked about yesterday had been dug more or less for the last 20 or 30 or more years. A lot of the stuff we know we've known for a while. At Gath, we're digging again this July, and you'll all be there to help. Number one. Keep track, okay? So the problem with this is, is that every summer we find something new, and normally it's making new questions and maybe answering one or two old ones, but the list just keeps growing. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is actively changing. Uh, all right, so moving on. Uh, the first thing we need to talk about is where is Telesophy Gath? And for those of you in the back, it's down here by the floor. Okay? Uh, I want to thank also Professor Aaron Mayer, Barlon University, excellent guy. Most of the pictures you're going to see in here are property of the project. We have a staff photographer who goes around. So you'll see the really nice pictures. Those are from the dig, and you'll see the kind of junky ones. Those are mine. Um, but Aaron has been incredibly supportive, an amazing director of this project, and just a fun guy to work with. Okay, so we're in Israel. Jerusalem, you know where that's at. Yesterday, we talked a little bit about the geography. Um, this is Telesophy. It's a giant, lumbering beast of a hill. Uh, I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. We looked at this map yesterday, and we talked about uh, the coastal plain, where the Philistines mostly live. We talked about this central region that's the gentle rolling hills, the Shvela. And then we talked about the upper, the big hills, the mountains, right? Uh, yesterday's site, Lachish, sits right here on one of these rolling hills. Uh, Telesophy is going to be a similar situation. In fact, this is floating above Telesophy, looking towards the west, okay? Uh, in the distance, on a clear day, you would see the Mediterranean right here. Uh, you can see Safi is literally the very first hill of the hill country. You guys see that? Okay. So rolling hills this direction, beautiful farmland, and Kansas in that direction. Okay? <laughs> I'm from Kansas. Um, and you can really see as the first hill, it dominates the landscape. Uh, this is the far side you couldn't see in the picture. Uh, this is area F where I like to dig. Uh, but you can see how steep these cliffs are, right? Uh, for those of you in the front, you can see this kind of strip of the white limestone uh, chalk that makes up the majority of the tell. You can see some of the outcroppings here. And this is one of the reasons Telesafi gets its name. Uh, Telesafi Arabic meaning uh, like the white tell, okay? So that's one of the probable origins for this name. Uh, but you can see a huge mound. Uh, you can see the remains of an Arab village that existed up to 1948 before it was abandoned. Uh, and at the very top remains of a crusader fortress. Uh, so it, it's a very neat site, it's a very complex site, uh, and it's a huge, huge uh, presence uh, along the valley. Now if we're looking at the excavation areas at Telesafi, uh, we've excavated in a few spots uh, down off the Tel in Area D. We're going to look at a lot of stuff from there today. Uh, one of our main excavations is area A and E kind of connected, uh, and P, this little piece here, which has new stuff this year, and then area F at the top of the hill. And then we'll talk about this feature a little bit later. Okay, One of the cool things that we've changed since last year, and I hinted at this a little bit yesterday, is that we're now going completely digital in the field, which can cause a few headaches, uh, but in the end, it's going to make things a lot more efficient. Uh, this picture is a little dark, but what you'll see here is one shade cloth. Come dig with us in the shade. Um, we do work under shade, 
But you'll see set up in the squares, we have a folding table, uh, a power cord, and a router. <laughs> We're actually using laptops in the field now. We have to put them in boxes so we can see the screen and protect them from the wind. Uh, but everything that we do, used to do with pen and paper is now going into computers and updated to a server on the spot. Uh, so this means generators to run all this stuff. And it's, you know, we're learning. Uh, but this is kind of the cutting edge of archaeology. Uh, and a lot of this is being fueled by a brand new grant that the excavation has won over the last year. And this grant comes in at right around $4 million with matching funds, which is one of the largest grants, I think the largest grant to ever be awarded for archaeology in Israel. So this is, this is the place to be digging right now, and things are about to get really exciting. Oh, dates. Okay. Nobody likes them, but we have to talk about them, right? Um, I made the joke last year, if I could, I would just kiss dating goodbye. Uh, yeah, right? Okay. So as archaeologists, we use all these funny terms. We talk about the early Bronze Age, right? Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age, Iron One, the Iron Age One, Iron Age Two, okay? Sometimes I'll abbreviate these and I'll just say late bronze. If I throw that out there, I'm talking about the late Bronze Age. Um, I've thrown this stuff in again today because I was asked about my most precious finds yesterday. Um, and if we start, start here in the early Bronze Age, this is kind of what I talked about a little bit yesterday. Uh, last summer we were digging down in Area E, which is the early Bronze Age, and I told you that I was given this area and told, you're not going to find much, but, you know, go dig it anyway. Um, and so I said, well, we're going to dig this because it's still a little high and we need to bring it down to level. Uh, what we ended up finding was the corner of the room of a house. Um, we did a little extra work in this alleyway, which is literally broken pottery in a streetway. You think about throwing out your trash and just layers of pottery, almost as much pottery as dirt, if you can imagine that kind of density. Um, which made pottery washing from this area a nightmare. There was just so much to go through. Um, and then we had this large house with two rooms and a doorway connecting them. But this is the house that we excavated, so right up here. Uh, and as we came down on this floor, the first thing we saw was this kind of hump. It was like, is this a bowl? Is this a jar? What are we coming down on? Uh, as we got down, we exposed the whole floor and found six whole vessels in place. Uh, and there you can see them, frozen in time from the day they were last used. Uh, a new picture I have for you is what they actually look like glued back together. Uh, and you can't really see this in the previous pictures, but this one has a large net pattern painted on it. Uh, so really nice stuff coming out. If we move on from the early bronze and the middle bronze, this is my other prized possession. Uh, here we are back up on that cliffside in Area F, and this is basically what I spent the first half of my archaeological career doing, is digging this big hole. But part of it is this large Middle Bronze Age fortification wall. Uh, the team from CBC uh, has recently been stuck digging on this dangerous, dangerous cliff. I don't know why we put CBC on the cliff, but <laughs> they don't talk back anymore. Uh, <laughs> If Brian ever sees this video, I love you, Brian. Um, also, we have uh, what we call a rampart uh, or a glossy, and this is just a large bank of earth packed up against the wall. Yesterday, we looked at Lachish, and we talked about how uh, it was a strategy to dig under a wall to try to undermine it, right? Uh, what this does is it makes a lot more dirt to dig under if you ever wanted to collapse the wall, and it also pushes your enemy back. Uh, so this is really steep, and if you're an archer, you would much rather shoot out than straight down on somebody. So it puts a little separation. So that's, that's the wall and the glossy. Okay, we're moving on. We're traveling through time. Buckle up. Late Bronze Age. In the Late Bronze Age, uh, things start to get interesting at Telesophy. This is a large uh, house, and this, all of this actually overlays what I just showed you a little bit ago with those early Bronze Age pots, where the big tall guy, the big tall guy actually came out right here. This was that section that we had excavated. They said, you won't find anything. But over the top of that was this giant house, pillar bases, okay? Um, 
In the Late Bronze Age, one thing that we know about uh, Israel is that we have a lot of Egyptian contact. And so one of the things that we find a fair amount of are actually Egyptian scarabs. Uh, this is one that we pulled up as we were taking out the rest of the Late Bronze material. Uh, you can see we take silly putty, basically, and push it in there to see what it says. Um, here's another one made out of faience. It's kind of a light green uh, paste material. And then we also get really nice imported pottery. Uh, those of you guys that stopped and played with the pottery I brought uh, have seen some of this. Uh, it's not like the stuff they're making here. Uh, in the late Bronze Age is the time of internationalism. There's trade, there's ships moving. Uh, and so we see a lot of imported goods come from Cyprus, uh, the area surrounding Greece, the Aegean. Uh, and these are all things that we're seeing uh, at what would be Canaanite Gath at this time. A new addition this summer, and this kills me because I'm the wall guy. I like to work on the walls at Safi. Uh, I have pictures of the tell with lines going everywhere. It's kind of like beautiful mind trying to track what I think I see. Uh, but this new wall came out. And what we had before, we had these little stubs coming up in these squares. And you can see, this is getting really deep. Um, the back side of this is at least eight feet. Um, so they've done a lot of digging here and found almost nothing, which won't happen to you when you come dig with us. You'll find whole pots, big pots, lots of pots, OK? Uh, but they had these little wall stubs, and they didn't know where they were going. And so this summer, you can see this is our path that the nature park has put through the tell for tourists. Directly under the path we've been walking on for the last 10, 12 years, that's not far below the surface, if you can tell, is this giant wall. Uh, from the late Bronze Age, and we're just figuring out what's going on here. We had no idea this would be here, and what's peculiar is that during the late Bronze Age, we don't have a lot of fortified sites using their own newly constructed walls. They may reuse the large walls from the Middle Bronze Age, like I just showed you, but something like this is generally not happening uh, through Israel. So we have a new puzzle. This is the kind of thing where it's like, oh, there's the wall, and it's like, wait, we have a wall? Uh, so now we have a list of, of 20 questions we need to figure out. Okay. So in the big story of Israel, uh, we get to the Iron Age one, and this is when uh, the time we typically associate with the Israelites showing up in the land. It's also the same time that we associate with the Philistines arriving. The Philistines are not originally from Israel, okay? Okay. They probably come from somewhere in the Aegean based off some of the cultural things we see with cooking, uh, that we see with names, uh, uh, that we see with the art forms on the pottery. Uh, so at the same time that the Philistines are coming in, we have the Israelites coming in, and they settle in the lands right next to each other. And what do we see in the Old Testament? They're constantly rubbing up against each other, right? There's friction there and tension. In the Iron One uh, at Tel Asafi, here you can see these initial settlements uh, that we've basically tracked on the pottery. I don't know if the orange and the red show too well, but this is basically what we associate with the Philistine settlement and the early Israelite settlement. Uh, at Tel Asafi, we've been fortunate to actually find a, a, a spot on the tell where we have this initial Philistine presence. And this is a big deal because people said, eh, it's too far inland, you know, the Philistines came on their boats or they came down the coast they probably didn't make it inland this early. It probably took time for them to get in there. Uh, but as we were excavating, we came on, you'll see we're talking about this area specifically, right here. Um, a room with a mud brick wall and two stone walls, which we later found out are reused um, from the late Bronze Age. But they used the existing architecture from the late Bronze Age and the middle Bronze Age city wall and put in a mud brick wall uh, and had their house here. So there's a large stone to sit on, uh, and then this, this surface, which was just a packed dirt floor. And what was interesting is about every probably four to six centimeters, we had a new layer of flooring. So just imagine laminations, floor upon floor upon floor, as they you know, sweep everything to the side, lay down a new floor, pack it, and you're good. Uh, they redid their floors too. Okay, so what do we find here? We find stuff like this. Uh, you gotta realize, this is the size of your thumbnail. 
Um, but somehow one of the scientists caught it because they were going slowly. There's no way that I would have caught it because I probably would have been flying with a pickaxe. And okay, but every little piece counts. Okay, this is something the size of your thumbnail, and this is something that screams early Philistine presence um, at a site where people said, "No, nah, I don't think you're going to get it." You can see here. This is actually the shape of a bird, and this is a very traditional Philistine motif. Um, so there's the whole bird. He'll come back later, so keep him in mind. Um, but you can see the eye and the head on this. Once you know what you're looking for, this is actually something, right? You can see it on this guy. Okay, so that's, that's typical Philistine decoration. Uh, this one you can't see. This is a spindle, spindle whirl uh, or a button that we found of uh, dark stone, and actually this is one that a fox dug out for us. We didn't find it. We'd cleaned everything for pictures and came back the next morning to take the last day's photos and found that an animal had dug in our perfect straight walls and collapsed a whole thing of dirt. But in that, we found a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, it's an unwritten rule of archaeology that the best stuff is always in the bulks, those temporary walls that we leave while we're excavating. Okay, so the pottery that came off this floor is an assortment of stuff, uh, but we have this really important Mycenaean 3C stuff. And if you played with the pottery yesterday, if you come up and play with it after today, I'll show you this stuff. This is the really nice stuff that they make right when they arrive. It's locally made, but it's still using the old technologies. They know how to decorate it right. They know how to spin the clay right. Uh, and it's just a different quality. So we see the really nice stuff and say, OK, we've got our Philistines. And so that kind of looks like uh, where this stuff is coming from. This mud brick wall that we're talking about, the funny thing was is we knew we had the brick wall, but it wasn't until another animal came and dug again. My, my MVP is an animal, um, <laughs> the best archaeologist I have. But you can see when he dug away here, we can actually see the brick lines. Do you see that laying through? Okay. Uh, but the funny thing was is we were looking for the foundation of this wall because normally when you go and you look for a wall line, if you have bricks, you normally have a stone foundation, because that's, that's how you build a wall. You stone foundation, mud bricks on top. The problem was we couldn't find the foundation when we cut down and did a little section of it. Um, but what we realized is that what we had was mud brick laid directly on top of the soil. And our later excavations demonstrated that this dirt underneath uh, is just a bunch of late Bronze Age soil that was intentionally dumped there to raise the level of the room. Uh, we know a little bit more about that now, but they basically came and said, okay, this looks like it could work. Let's just level it off. So they poured a bunch of dirt in. It's full of late Bronze Age pottery, put on their new floor, and built a mud brick wall to separate off this portion of the house. You can see this handsome guy, not wearing an Indiana Jones hat, Red Sox hat. Um, but you can see, there's the fill from the late Bronze Age, and there's the mud brick wall. If you can see a line there, you really need to be digging with us, because this is, we call it seeing dirt, okay? If you can see that, you really should put your skills to use. Uh, it's tricky stuff. Okay, why this is important is because if you remember the map uh, where Telesophy was, not too far away is another Philistine site, uh, the city of Ekron. And at Ekron, they had the exact same thing. Uh, this is from back in 1996, but they found these are gorgeous mud bricks, uh, perfectly excavated and laid directly on the soil. And so we ask questions, you know, is this because the Philistines didn't understand the climate here or the building conditions? What was it that made them lay these bricks directly on the soil? But the fact that we have two very early Philistine settlements doing this makes us think. Uh, a little, about, a little bit about these people and what they're doing as they arrive. If we move uh, a little bit later in the Iron Age one, uh, we get this typical Philistine bichrome pottery. And this stuff is gorgeous. I mean, you can see the designs, intricate. Israel will never really decorate its own pottery like this. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, the, best, the best pottery that we're getting is uh, the Philistine stuff. You see the spirals, you see the bird. Uh, and what we have here is a typical drinking set. Um, this is a strainer jug for pouring beer, most likely, little holes to drain out the husks, uh, a large crater for mixing wine, uh, and then you see the drinking bowl down here. 
we have pieces of one of these in the pottery here today, a lot of these, and probably one of these. So come play with it. Okay, moving into the Iron II. Yesterday we talked about the Iron Age II as a time when a lot of biblical events happen. We saw that at Lachish and the events that were happening in the ancient Near Eastern text with Sennacherib stuff, but also in the biblical text, right? Uh, that's no exception when we talk about Philistine stuff. The Philistines really uh, are active during the Iron II. This is from Area A. This is one of those main excavation areas, and I realize this is a little dark back there, and it looks jumbled. Well, it's even more jumbled when you're digging it. This is an interpretation once we finish it, uh, but these are all the walls, and this stratigraphy, the layers, are especially compact. Uh, so one of the things that we do as we're doing this archaeology is we're sorting out the walls and trying to visualize uh, where things go. And if you like coloring, this is good because that's how we do it. We start connecting the walls and making sure that uh, what we have actually makes sense. Okay, so what we're going to talk a little bit about is the 10th and the 9th century now that we're in the Iron Age too. Oh, our friend. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. Everybody loves Goliath. Uh, 2005, I believe, we had this pop up. Uh, we caught it in pottery reading because the pottery was actually clean. And so you're going, you scrub it off, and then you can actually see this. And what this is, uh, is an inscription. They've actually scratched into the surface of this piece of pottery a couple of names. Uh, it doesn't say Goliath, that's the thing. Uh, when it came out in the newspapers, it was all over CNN, New York Times, they found Goliath's cereal bowl, you know. Um, <laughs> the press is good though, you, you want that. Um, what's actually written on here is Alwat and Walat. Um, and last year we used the analogy that this would be like having a character in the Bible named John, but we dig up a piece of pottery that says Juan. Okay, um, It doesn't say Goliath, but culturally, it's right there. This is in, in the wheelhouse of the names that we would expect to be coming from the Aegean. Okay? Uh, so it doesn't prove Goliath exists, but it says, okay, the names that we're getting in the Bible are very, very realistic. And when we're talking about the cultural world of the Bible, this all fits perfectly. So that's the Goliath shirt. This is... a. Uh, a little bull head that they excavated this summer. Um, looks like a cow. I like him. Uh, it's fun when these things come up because, you know, by this point, they're almost indestructible because it's such a small piece of clay, and you sit there and you do puppet shows and talk with them. Uh, everybody gets their picture with it, you know, in hopes of making the magazine covers. And uh, So if you come, you can take your picture with all the fun toys we dig up, okay? Uh, so that's also from the same time as around this Goliath shirt. What happens though, we get into the ninth century, and in the biblical text we find out at that time Hazael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. That's it. Just a little blip, no big deal. Just one of the biggest cities in the entire ancient Near East at the time. You saw how huge the Tell is. The city runs all the way down to the Ela River. This is all we get in the Bible. Hazael, he went, he took it. That's it. Okay, but what does this look like on the ground? Okay, one of the things that we've found, and you can actually see it uh, on this map, uh, is following this yellow line around, is there's a giant siege trench that has been cut in. We talked about siege warfare a lot yesterday, uh, and we saw how, how much effort went into that with the ramp, with all the different um, siege engines and that stuff. Uh, but what you see here is basically a scar on the land uh, that came up in the, the aerial photography. And so what they did is they went and they excavated it. You can see it here again, right? Guys up front probably have a better shot of that. Um, this is what it looked like when they actually went and excavated it. This thing is massive, okay? You know, I dig for a living and I know how hard it is to dig a big hole. And to dig a big hole this long, I mean, this is impressive stuff. Uh, you can see the stone that it's carved into. We've cut into the bedrock. Uh, and you can see how this is just a standard, like, fill. Like, this has just been washed in over thousands of years, right? Uh, so this is the siege trench. Uh, probably designed to shut them in 
so they can't get out, get their food, get their water. And you wait them out, and eventually you finish them off. But this is what we find when we start excavating this destruction. Yesterday, we talked about Lachish and how the destruction seals everything, gives you that snapshot in time. What we have right now at Gath is unbelievable. I mean, you, you could close your eyes and start digging, and this is what you would find. Um, here's a section. We have a lot of uh, bowls, some jugs. There are loom weights in this from another angle. And this is when we thought, oh, this is great. This is one of the first years. We didn't even know what we were getting into. Okay. Oh, look, a smashed pot. This is so great. Um, this is stuff from this summer. Like, it just keeps getting better. You can see some of the things are almost completely whole, just a crack. They're pulling them out in one piece. Um, for those of you, you probably can't see this. What she's doing is she's actually removing the soil from inside of this pot and putting it into a sandbag, and then we're taking it back for residue analysis and stuff. So we're able to now, with the scientists that we have, uh, sample all of this stuff from inside because we know when this city died, when it, was, when it was conquered, things froze. So we have a shot of everything that's inside the storage vessels. We have some of them with grain in them, right? Uh, we can do residue analysis to see if they had wine or oil on the inside. Uh, and when we're talking about excavating the enemy, uh, we're finding out a lot about diet and daily life and things that we would never get from reading in the biblical text, okay? Uh, this is a great general shot just to see what the excavation looks like, mostly organized chaos at some points. You can see we're digging under shade again. This looks comfortable, right? Um, this is Debbie, and Debbie is in the middle of excavating what looks like a bunch of baseballs down here, for those that you can see. It's, these are loom weights, and there are hundreds of them in this area. What this is, uh, these are the weights that would hang at the bottom of the threads for loom, for weaving. Uh, and we have no idea what the textile industry was at Gath, but this is a piece of it. We're starting to figure out something uh, down in the lower city. Uh, but you can see lots of buckets. This guy is actually in the middle of taking elevations. That's a prism for the total station, so they're shooting lasers and identifying levels because all of that has to be recorded. Uh, you see a really nice plaster floor that he's standing on in this large room. Uh, you can see a paved room. They've actually laid flat stones down back here uh, as a pavement, then a plastered room, and then the weaving room. Now in the corner of this, I'm referencing this for earlier or for later, but the, uh, the altar that we found will be right in this area. So it's in the middle of this giant complex that has beautiful floors laid down, really well-constructed walls, uh, and you can see how high some of these are still preserved to. So this is, this is a fun area. Okay. This destruction is so big, though, uh, that the prophet Amos writes about it. He says, Woe to those that are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountains of Samaria. So he's writing to the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, the notable men of the first nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalna and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, and then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory any greater than your territory? O oh, you who put away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Amos is saying, go down to Gath of the Philistines. They know who Gath is. Gath has been an enemy all this time. This is one of the largest cities. You've seen how big it is. And it's wiped off the map. In, a, in an instant, all of that is frozen. And so when Amos is looking at the house of Israel and he's saying, buckle up, guys. You think you're too good for this? You think you're bigger than this? Look at all of these kingdoms that have fallen. Uh, and that's where this archaeology at Gath really puts this into perspective. Just a few more of the things. These are whole vessels that are coming out. No assembly required. Kind of nice, right? Uh, you can see we've left the dirt in this one for analysis. Uh, <laughs> you, you too can dig up your own vessel and drink from it. Um, I don't know what he was doing in this picture, but I loved it. Um, we find a lot of these really cool cult stands. Um, just beautiful. And this, a lot of these down in the area D where the destruction is heavy. Uh, this is the whole assemblage, and this is what came from the top of the tell in area A. We haven't even taken a picture like this for the lower area yet. 
Um, if we tried to do all the vessels, it would be, it will be twice, three times this by the time we're done. Uh, so you can see just an amazing collection of pottery. Uh, really, really spectacular stuff. One of the things, now that we're getting a little later in time, we showed you the early stuff that I said the Philistines made when they first came. And then I showed you the bichrome, which was with the bird and the red and the black and white. By the time we get here, we have a new type of pottery called late Philistine decorated ware. So we've lost a lot of these motifs with the, with the white painting. And they're doing a little bit more of what other people do. Uh, you can see this one kind of has vertical lines on it. Uh, I'll show you a piece of it, I have it with me. Uh, and that's burnishing, and what they've done is they've rubbed that to kind of polish it. But you'll see some of these have red, uh, the red slip, the red color on them with the lines, but they also have little thin bands of either white or black paint. And so this is something that comes in at this time. We were talking about how pottery helps us date things yesterday. This is another way we know in a Philistine context where we're at in time. Uh, so another very interesting cultural piece. There you can see the up and down lines on it again, the red color. Uh, it used to be called Ashdod ware, like I said, late Philistine decorated ware, or Lapidou, is what, as we're, nobody wants to say late Philistine decorated ware, it's a mouthful, okay? But you can see those lines. Okay, for those of you that can see this, I think this one should show okay. This is a piece of late Philistine decorated ware. This came out of uh, area D, I believe, down at the bottom of the tell, and we knew it was the red, and we knew that there was a little bit of shiny to it. And we saw the red and or the, the black and the white, but something's different about this. What do you see? Remember this guy? Okay. So what we have is actually the breast of the bird on this piece of Philistine decorated ware. So this was a really peculiar thing. All the archaeologists freaked out. Because here's a spot where they're holding on to these earlier cultural motifs from probably a hundred years earlier, and it's somehow come back in. Uh, so this is really neat. This is, uh, it's a little bit archaic, it's a little bit out of place, uh, but there's some sort of, uh, some guy probably thought, hey, this is going to be really great. I'm going to draw an old school bird on my pot, and people are like, what are you doing? Uh, but it made a lot of archaeologists really happy. Okay, so there's, I know, if only we knew who he was. During the same time in the destruction, this is now back up at the top of the tell in area A. Uh, we have a lot of walls again, but we have something really special here. And if you see these two circles, this is actually a temple. And you'll probably recall from the Bible a very famous Philistine temple with two really big pillars that a guy got in the middle of and put his arms on, right? You remember the story of Samson? Okay, so the great thing is, is that as we excavated this and we were trying to figure out what was going on, we found these and we said, is this really a temple? Sure enough, it turns out to be. But we put two stacks of buckets because we have hundreds and hundreds of buckets. And when you put those on there, a grown man can put his arms on either side and they're just the right distance. Uh, so this is really neat. Uh, once it, this is not the temple that Samson was in, uh, but this is a Philistine temple that fits the description. It, it matches what we know from other Philistine temples. Okay. And unfortunately, this year, the temple was de not destroyed, uh, disassembled. So these column bases have now gone off to a museum. Uh, as you can see, sometimes if you're strong and you come to dig, you have to lift heavy things. So... Uh, football players, come dig with us, please. Uh, they don't look like they're hurting. I mean, this guy looks like an Abercrombie model. Um, that's my career ambition. That's my backup plan. Archaeology doesn't work out. Okay, so in the corner of that temple, what we found just off to the side is this pile of stuff, and you're like, what am I looking at? What you're actually looking at is a collection of cultic implements. Uh, and this was one of those days that's really exciting on the dig. Uh, you always know when people's cell phones start ringing. You always see the movies, right? And it's like CIA things. Everybody's at the White House press banquet, and one pager goes off, and then they all go off. On the dig, it'll be a cell phone, and then another cell phone. Supervisor's cell phones start ringing. And people are like, okay, I'll be there. I'll be there. 
so we get down there, and the whole dig is like gathered around. What is going on? And when you look and you see that dig director is down there with a trowel pointing and directing, you know stuff's going on. Uh, and so what we had is this collection of cultic implements. And why this is important is we know the Philistines are bad guys in the Bible, right? They always get the really bad press. They're called pagans. They're, uh, they're called, uh, they do sorcery and that kind of stuff. But we don't know anything about their religion. We know it's wrong, <laughs> but we don't actually know what they believed. And so anytime we find something like this, a temple or something that could be related to cult, uh, it's a really big deal. Uh, one of the things that came out of this is this pomegranate-shaped thing. It may have been a rattle. It may have uh, had something in it to actually rattle around. But you can see at the bottom, uh, it's pierced. So it would actually hang upside down. Uh, we've thought that this may hang from a wooden colt stand uh, or even like a mobile-type apparatus. Uh, but you'll see the pomegranate shape, uh, and it actually hangs like a pomegranate would. And so there's that shape again, right? Pomegranate. Other people still use this shape in their products. <laughs> you can see the, the pomegranate shape there, right? Okay. Uh, this is a kernos. This is for pouring liquid offerings. You put uh, wine or other precious liquid in it and make pour it out. Uh, these guys have holes in them so that they actually spit out the liquid. Uh, very cool, a ring kernos. And this is one of those things that we know connects back to the Aegean. We see predecessors there. Okay. I like these guys, the ducks on the edge. It would have been a big crater, probably. Uh, you see that Philistine bird motif come out, but this time in 3D. So very neat. Uh, also, we have press installations. Uh, at the top of the tell, some olive oil production. I don't know if you can see this, but I'll outline it. This is a giant limestone donut, basically. Uh, and what these guys are doing, this guy's a missionary in Poland, by the way. Anybody can dig. Um, like, we get everybody from all walks of life. Uh, excellent guy. Brought his daughter. They had a blast. They were back this summer. Um, what they're doing is they're using a crane for an engine block and trying to get this extremely heavy stone out of the square uh, because you have to move these things. You can see this stuff is in the way. You got to get it out of the way to go down. Um, the problem was is that our logistics guy, this guy, told us that we had to take it and put it on the truck, uh, which is fine. We take stuff back to the lab all the time. It's a part of the, part of the game. We do it. And so the problem was in the process of doing this, we almost died twice. And in the end, the digs truck lost a tail light and the tailgate broke the hinge off because uh, as we started to roll it, it just collapsed and just kind of took that end of the truck with it. Uh, and then we found out it wasn't going to the lab. Our logistics guy just thought it would be poetic if he planted this olive oil production weight uh, with an olive tree growing through the middle in his garden. Uh, so we <laughs> risked life and limb so he could grow an olive tree through a donut in his garden. Uh, but this is the kind of fun stuff that happens all the time. Uh, it's a part of it, but really neat things happening, okay? The last part the altar call, right? You always have to finish with the altar call. This is our stone altar, right? Uh, the story on this, this is what happens when science gets in the way also. Okay, the story is, is that this was in the corner of a square. Uh, I told you earlier, the best things are always in the bulk, right? right? Right outside where you're supposed to be digging. Well, what happened is, originally, the border for this square would have run right along here, just missing this thing. But in the off season, some kids came to the tell. And what do you do when you have a big hole? You jump on the edge, right? See if you can collapse it in and fall in. It's fun. Uh, boys will be boys. Uh, so what happens, we get to the dig, and we have to start cleaning up these edges to make them straight for the pictures again. And in the middle of cleaning this up, you can see right when they found it, right here, um, the pickaxe hits this, and they go, whoa, big rock. Yeah, really big rock, OK? Uh, this is what we had, and it was hidden literally inches outside of our excavation area. So it was an unfortunate accident, uh, but it ended up being a very fortunate accident. And the thing that uh, we see with this, uh, did I put it in? No, I didn't, okay. 
What's really neat about this altar is that it's cut and finished uh, on one side. The back side, you can see the line of it, is really rough. Uh, now, people have joked that uh, if you know anything about the, the prescriptions, the Bible for building altars, you're supposed to use uncut stone. Uh, we like to joke that when their Jewish friends came over, they quick flipped it around and said, eh, what do we have in the house that's kosher? Um, <laughs> but that's probably not the case. It was probably up against a wall um, because it never looks like the backside had horns. It looks completely unfinished, just raw stone. Um, so it may have been up against a wall in, in function in that capacity. What we also see are these two horns. Now, we can go to a bunch of different altars uh, in Israel and Syria and find horns. Uh, you're familiar with the phrase grabbing hold of horns of the altar, right? That's a thing. That starts in the ancient Near East, and that's what this is based out of. But this one only has two. And this is really, this is, this is peculiar. Uh, one of the places that we're looking for the origins of this are back in the Aegean uh, to see if this is possibly connected to some of the two horn, the horns of consecration that they have there. Uh, it's been published. It's being explored. Time will tell. Okay. Like I said, this is what happens when we do science. Every single one of these blue post-it notes is a different sample, uh, each with its own numbers, elevations. Uh, and the scientists take this back to the lab, and they do their science-y things to it. Uh, but we're, when we're dealing with an altar and you're asking, are they using incense? Are they burning things? Was something maybe sacrificed here? These are all questions that... Once you dig this away, it's gone forever. And so we take as much time as possible uh, to clear this stuff out carefully and really understand it. Uh, flotation, all this dirt will be taken back, run through water, and you would be surprised what comes out when you start floating dirt. Uh, small seeds and husks and all of it, organic material that's been charred and so will actually float, and we can sift that out. Uh, so all a part of the process just to figure out what's going on with a biblical enemy, right? This was the day that you could see everybody looking in reverence as it kind of hoists up. I, I felt like saluting at this moment. Uh, one of our great finds, you can see the, the beautiful white cliffs in the background of the tell. So one, as, as we kind of wind down a little bit, the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Another blip, right? This is, this is the very beginning of Amos, 1-1, one, one, and he just throw this, throws this out, there's an earthquake. Uh, one of the things that we're working on at Telesophy is we think we actually have some evidence for this earthquake. Uh, what we have is that after, after the destruction of Hazael, after Hazael came in and, you know, probably knocked over a lot of buildings, uh, there were wall stumps left standing because you don't completely uh, level everything, right? You leave some stumps. But what we found is that at this spot in Area F, these wall stumps jumbled when they fell. They didn't just fall over from age. Um, and we've brought in seismologists to check this stuff out. And what we found is that when a wall falls, it falls in one direction. All the bricks kind of tumble with some sense of uniformity. What's happened here is we've actually gone in, and my good friend Eli had to do this one summer, individually detailed the bricks to see if we could find the angles. And when we brought the seismologist out, he said, yeah, this is an earthquake. Because they tumble and they undulate as they fall. And that's uh, normally what happens when you have this shift. Uh, so this is one more piece of kind of cutting edge archeology span that's happening. And it's still bringing to light these little blips in the biblical text. Now, if you come back and dig with us this summer, there's some very exciting things happening here. I just told you, this is the stub of a ninth century wall, which means the ninth century is right under this. So all that stuff that you saw down from area D and from area A with all the pots, the same destruction is right under this. Uh, and we've already had out this direction a little bit of that come up, uh, but we're really excited to get into this and see. Uh, and Area F, this is probably where we'll be digging. So you can see as we get in, uh, just winding down into the 8th century, we talked about 701 yesterday. 
This is our house at Telesafi that we looked at yesterday that was destroyed in 701. Uh, it's really nice because we have the architecture and you can see one, two, three rooms kind of in parallel. And what this lines up with is a typical Judean house. This is what we call a four room house. You have those one, two, three rooms. And normally the fourth room is a long broad room across the back. So if you look at that again, one, two, three, and this may have been the broad room or back here, okay? Uh, so what I really want to get at today is that we're talking about excavating a biblical enemy. We know the Philistines are the bad guys in the Bible, they're the enemy, but what the Bible doesn't give us is this cultural side. Who are they actually, who they actually represent as a people, right? Uh, and what we get is we look at the Canaanite occupation there and then uh, the Philistine op occupation, we find out that, one, it's really important before biblical history picks up. The late Bronze Age stuff is really significant, and we're starting to add new wrinkles to the conversation of the late Bronze Age. Uh, and that's really before we even pick up the press of the Bible. Uh, but once we get into biblical history, once we start talking about the time of David and the, the different kings, the prophets, we find glimpses of history. It's very important, and it's, it's shedding new light on it constantly. Uh, and in the end, and as we continue to do this, we'll continue to see that Israel's enemy in this case actually has its own rich culture that the Bible doesn't describe. Uh, but as we continue to excavate this, we continue to gain further insight and really understand it and hopefully bring the picture even more full circle eventually.